Uh, great. So um, let's uh, go back to thinking about uh, linear programming duality, which we mentioned last time. We mentioned it last time mainly in the context of the feasibility problem. Like if you have a linear polytope, you want to know if it's empty or not. But there's like a very simple extension to optimization problems, which I'll now tell you. So let's suppose you're trying to solve this uh, optimization version of an LP. You have some uh, linear inequalities, and you're trying to maximize c dot x. Uh, now, here's how duality works. Suppose you're staring at this linear programming. You're thinking for a long time, gee, I wonder what is the maximum possible value of c dot x, assuming x satisfies all these inequalities. Imagine some super smart person came along to you and pointed out some non-negative numbers, lambda 1 through lambda m. They said, check it out. If you multiply the first inequality by lambda 1, the second inequality by lambda 2, dot, 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 the last inequality by lambda m, uh, well, you get new inequalities, which are also satisfied by x, any x that satisfies the, the, all the inequalities. And suppose this person said, check it out. If you add these up, you'll get another true implication of these inequalities, another inequality that must be satisfied by any x that satisfies all these inequalities. And imagine a miracle happens, and uh, these inequalities with these multipliers add up to the inequality c dot x is at most beta, where c is exactly your objective c. That'd be amazing. Uh, but such lambdas would be to you a proof or a certificate that the optimum possible value is at most beta. Because, you know, in this, with these lambdas, like c dot x at most beta is a true implication of these in, any x that satisfies these inequalities has to satisfy this, so c dot x is at most beta. And just a very simple extension of what we did last time, uh, you can use Farkash lemma to show that actually there always exists not just certificates like this, but optimal certificates like this, lambdas which uh, achieve c dot x less than or equal to beta for beta being the actual maximum value of c dot x. So there will always be like a certificate like this, these certifying lambdas, which certify to you just by like multiplying them against the inequalities and adding them up, the optimal maximum value of c dot x. Uh, so that's cool. That's linear du programming duality for optimization version of LPs. And again, this LP is called the primal LP, and the dual LP is the LP whose goal is to find these best certifying lambdas. So you're trying to find lambdas, one for each uh, constraint up here, m lambdas, which are all non-negative. And uh, the constraint that when you multiply the ith one by lambda i and add them up, the left-hand side becomes c dot x. If you think about it for one second, it's equivalent to saying that like the transpose of the A matrix times lambda equals the C vector. And uh, the right-hand side is just, uh, when you multiply by lambdas and add up, is b dot lambda. And you see this is also a linear, it's like an optimization linear program. The lambdas are the variables, and um, b dot lambda is the objective function. And trying to find like the best certifying lambdas, the lambdas which certify the best upper bound on c dot x, is a linear program. And in fact, the, the lambdas which give you the lowest possible um, upper bound by duality, this upper bound exactly is equal to the maximum of the original LP. And this, uh, this fact that there, this Farkash lemma fact that um, the best uh, upper bound certificate you can get out of the dual LP actually equals the maximum of the original LP is called strong duality. Um, this is the case when they're both finite. Um, some like edge cases if they're unbounded or infeasible. Uh, I should say that you know any feasible solution to the dual LP gives you a b dot lambda which is an upper bound on c dot x. So the fact that every feasible LP value is an upper bound on the primal's LP value is called weak duality. The fact that the best certificate is equal to the optimum of the primal LP is called a strong duality. And it's basically the same as Farkash lemma. Any questions about this? Looks like no questions so far. So uh, let me give you a life pro tip in this uh, CS Theory Toolkit class. Uh, first of all, you know, a preceding life pro tip is like whenever you have a problem, see if you can make it into an LP. And the, the life pro tip I'll give you now is whenever you have an LP, just always take its dual and see if you can interpret it. And I'll see, tell you what I mean by this through an example. 
So the last thing I want to talk about is I want to go back to the max flow problem, which is a maximization LP, and write down its dual LP and try to think about what the dual LP means. Uh, OK. So if you recall, this was the max flow LP. So put yourself back in mind of those railroads and the cement. You have the directed graph. You're trying to ship cement from S to T, trying to find a flow of how much cement along each edge. And you have the flow constraints for each vertex that says the amount coming in should equal the amount coming out. So we have these variables, F sub. That's a typo. It should say F sub B. Oh, no, that's not a typo. You want to maximize the amount of flow out of S. You have a variable F U V for every directed edge U V. You have these capacity constraints, so the flow should be between zero and the capacity of the edge. And these are the flow uh, conservation constraints that say for vertices other than, S and, other than S and T, the amount flowing in is equal to the amount flowing out. OK, so what I want to imagine doing, but I don't want to actually literally do, <laughs> is to take the dual of this, to find the dual LP that we uh, talked about on the previous couple of slides. So one thing you have to do is you have to uh, fix this LP up into the form we were talking about, where you only have less than or equal to constraints, which you can always do. We have equality constraints. We know how to convert those to less than or equal, like pairs of less than or equal to constraints. We have an uh, upper bound. We can negate that to get an upper bound, uh, lower bound. OK, so by messing around, you can convert this to the form that we talked about in the previous uh, slides. And then you can form this dual by having a lambda for each constraint and trying to find the best linear combination of the constraints that looks like objective function is at most blah. You should try to have the dual LP make this blah, the certificate, certified upper bound, as small as possible. And so it'll look something like this. And then you should do like the opposite of this like messing around. You should somehow clean this up to an equivalent LP. So this often happens when you take the, an LP. I'm not going to show it because it's a little bit nitty gritty. Um, but you'll get situations where, like, you know, you'll have, you know, some less than or equal to a constraint, and you'll see, oh, it'd be more natural if I called this a greater than or equal to constraint by negating both sides. Or sometimes you'll have, you know, a constraint with a less than or equal to and this constraint with a greater than or equal to, and you'll say, oh, I should convert this to an equality constraint. Um, stuff like this. So you kind of, like, clean it up to make it more nice. And I'll tell you the result of cleaning up the dual of this uh, max st flow LP. It looks like this. It's kind of complicated, so let's go through it slowly. Um, because, you know, in life, you'll be doing this a lot. You'll have your LP, you'll take its dual, you'll tidy it up, and now you'll be like, well, what the heck is this? I mean, can I think of this in some useful way beyond knowing that it's some minimization problem whose minimum value is equal to the maximum value of uh, the max flow problem? OK, so in this LP, there's two kinds of variables. We have a variable called lambda sub uv for each directed edge. And um, in some sense, these lambdas for each directed edge come from these capacity constraints. Remember, at a high level, you, know, you multiply each of the constraints in the primal by some lambdas. And those are your new variables. So these lambda uvs come from multiplying these capacity constraints by some lambda. Uh, but you also have like a constraint for each vertex here. And so you have different multipliers in your dual for these uh, vertex-based constraints. And I called them over here mu sub v. So in the dual LP, you also have some variables called mu sub v, one for each vertex. And those are somehow associated with the flow constraints. Um, good. And uh, the objective in the dual LP is to minimize the sum over all edges of the capacity uv times the lambda uv. And the mu's do not participate in the objective function, as it turns out. Uh, somehow a function of the fact that you have equalities here. Uh, but the, here are the constraints. You have a constraint on mu s that it should equal 1. So really, you don't even need to have a variable because you have to assign it to 1. But it's best to think of it as like a constraint that mu s has to equal 1 and a constraint that mu t has to equal 0. So these mu's are like assignments to the vertices. You have to assign 1 to the source vertex. You have to assign 0 to the target vertex. And uh, all the other vertices, you can assign a mu however you like. And you have some more constraints relating the lambdas and the mu's. So you have some more constraints. Uh, your constraint is that lambda uv should be at least mu u minus mu v. I'll draw a picture in a moment. And it should be non-negative. 
Okay, so you're if you're trying to optimize this, you're trying to minimize the sum over all the edges, capacity times lambda uv. So you're motivated to make the lambdas as small as you can. Um, you, there's a limit to how small you can make them based on your choice of the mu's. You can make them at most mu u minus mu v, and you can also can't make them negative. So, uh, okay. Let's uh, put our picture back up. This is our directed graph example with capacities. And really, uh, another thing you can say about this mystery LP, this dual LP that we're trying to interpret, is that really, even though you're kind of minimizing over all assignments to lambda and all assignments to mu, it's really just minimizing over all assignments to mu, the vertex, green vertex labels. And I'll tell you why. Imagine you came up with some assignments for the, the mu's, some green assignments for the mu's, and now you're like, okay, Suppose I use these mu's, like now I still gotta figure out the best lambdas to try to make this objective function as small as possible. But this part, finding the best lambdas given the mu's is trivial because you just have some, you know, given the mu's, you have some lower bound, uh, mu u minus mu v for lambda u v. And uh, you should just set lambda to be that lower bound because you're trying to make lambdas as small as you can. Well, there's another twist. You're not allowed, this could be negative and you're not allowed to set the lambdas to be negative. So in that case, you're like, well, I'll set it to be zero. So what I'm trying to say is like given mu's, you should always set the best lambda choice for lambda uv is to set lambda uv to be the difference of the mu's for its endpoints or zero, whichever is larger. Uh, so yeah, and then what are you trying to, what do you have to pay? It's the product, the sum over all the edges of the product of the capacity times the lambda. So let's just sort of try to imagine what's going on in this example. Um, if we're trying to solve this minimization problem. Okay, so the green represents the mu's. We're like obliged to put one on S and we're obliged to put zero on T. That's these two constraints. And now let's, let's imagine we're trying to put ones and zero, or not ones and zeros, but real numbers mu between one and zero um, on these other vertices. So let's think about what should we give to A? Well, there's a pretty big uh, capacity here between S and A, three. And so if we set mu to be something um, noticeably smaller than one, then we'll be a sort of, uh, the smaller we make it, the, the, uh, the bigger we'll be obliged to set the lambda for this thing. And if we make A 0.5, then this difference is 0.5. We'll be obliged to set lambda as large as 0.5 and we'll be paying three times 0.5 in the objective. So because this three is big, we might say to ourselves, gee, maybe I'll just make this one one. And then for this edge, I can make the lambda value zero and I won't pay anything for this edge in the objective. Um, on the other hand, like, you know, I'm just making stuff up here, but like you might say, you know, this capacity is one, it's not so bad. We kind of got to get to zero in a way. And like this drop here, this capacity is four. I'd really hate to have a large mu value for D because then I'd have to make this lambda large and that would cost me a lot. So I'd kind of like this to be close to zero. Let's just make it zero because you know this edge is not so bad. And similarly, I don't know, you might reason like this, that these might be good choices. And uh, it turns out that these green numbers I've put up here are actually the optimal choices for the mu's for this problem. And it's not a coincidence, as it turns out, that they happen to be all zero and one. So the mu's actually could be fractional, but an interesting thing happened again, the optimal mu's were zero and one. And um, what happens in this solution is for every directed edge that goes from a one to a zero, you have to set the lambda value to be one. And every edge that goes from one to one or zero to zero, you can set the lambda value to be zero. So you basically pay for exactly those edges in the, in the minimization problem that go from a one to zero. And what you pay is the capacity, which you can also think of as a cost. And finally, I can say what's going on here. This is actually turns out to be the LP relaxation for the natural integer linear program for the min ST cut problem. The min ST cut problem, if you haven't seen it before, is the problem of finding a set of vertices, capital S, that includes little s, doesn't include little t, and sort of has a uh, little cost across the boundary going from inside s to outside s as possible. Um, and that's sort of what this, this uh, LP is doing. 
if you think of uh, the muse as indicating absence or presence in the set capital S. So what I'm trying to say here is, here's the minimum SAE cut problem, written out as just an optimization problem. Given a directed graph with Cs on the edges, which now you think of as cost as, instead of capacity, find a set that of uh, vertices that sort of uh, includes S, but it, not T, such that the amount of cost uh, going from, you know, if you think of this as a cut disconnecting S from T, the amount of cost of the edges crossing the cut is as small as possible. And if you write down like an integer linear program that exactly captures min st cut, and then you relax it to a, a linear program, you'll get exactly this, which says that this minimum st cut LP is the dual to the uh, max st flow LP. And what's interesting is that um, this. Uh, strong duality that we know says that the max ST flow, that's exactly, the max ST flow is the exact solution of the, the LP. It's exactly equal to the minimum fractional ST cut, the minimum uh, solution to this linear programming version of ST cut. And that, since it's a relaxation, is less than or equal to the minimum true ST cut. And this actually makes sense if you think about it. If you have some cut S, uh, some set of vertices S that achieves the minimum, sort of uh, the most flow, it's kind of a bottleneck for the flow in the graph. And like the most flow you can get uh, out of S is equal to the total capacity coming out of the set S, or at least it's the most flow you can get is upper bounded by the total capacity coming out of the set S. So it's quite natural that the minimum ST cut is an upper bound on the maximum flow. And we've seen that through linear programming duality. Uh, in fact, you can show that, um, in fact, the nicest proof is through like uh, randomized rounding, that actually uh, the SD cut uh, LP has the nice property that uh, it's not a relaxation. The minimum fractional SD cut is actually equal to the minimum SD cut. And this can be proved in a way that's sort of um, like the other integrality proof we did. We don't have time for it today. Um, but you can prove it. And from this one deduces that um, the max ST flow is actually equal to the minimum cut. And since the max flow can be solved in polynomial time with linear programming, it implies that the minimum ST cut can also be found in polynomial time via linear programming. Okay, so that's another cool application of linear programming. Uh, I just want to close with a bit more of a, an anecdote. Um, so this fact that the max flow is equal to the, uh, max ST flow is equal to the min ST cut uh, it was also known prior to like this theory of linear programming. It was proved by Ford and Fulkerson. It was also proved independently by Peter Elias and Feinstein and uh, Shannon. And um, they, Ford and Fulkerson, remember, they were in contact with this guy, Ted Harris at Rand uh, uh, Corporation, who told them about the, the max flow problem. And um, you see, Ted Harris at Rand was, you know, his boss was this guy called General Ross, who was in the U.S. Air Force at the time. And I mentioned that Harris was also in particular interested in the Soviet railroad network. Um, and uh, in fact, he was not interested in the ST flow problem so much as the minimum ST cut problem, because, you know, the, our Air Force's motivation, the U.S. Air Force motivation, was to figure out the minimum ST cut in the Soviet railroad network. They really wanted to find, like, what is the cheapest set of cities we can like bomb to like disconnect, you know, the cement factory from the cement needing um, city. So uh, yeah, a bit of a, unfortunately, warlike uh, motivation for uh, Ted Harris and Ford Fulkerson uh, originally. But uh, yeah, well, I suppose it led to this nice theorem uh, in 